First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correctional officer, sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correctional officer. Uh, How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. And today is the second part of what we were discussing last week with Russ. This time we have the, um, the author, William Young. Now, he's got a book coming on the market sometime in late March, early April, is it? Yes. And the book... It's called uh, When Home Becomes a Housing Unit, and obviously that relates to us. Because, again, that deals with our mental health. I know if I was walking by that in a bookstore, I would pick it up and know, know exactly what that means. Russ, on the last show we did, he discussed, he knows for a fact, if he walked into a Barnes & Nobles and he saw that book, he would go back and say, you know what, I think I have to read this. Because the book hits home for those in the field because, obviously, we have an understanding of that balance between work and home. And obviously today I mentioned their names. William Young is the author and also have Russ Hamilton is going to sit on this interview as well. And again, we'll be discussing the balance between work and home overall, just the mental health and well-being of our officers. Now, again, um, I'm going to quickly go to our sponsor. When we come back, we're going to dive right into the topic, but I'm going to reintroduce you to our guests, which again will be William Young and Russ Hamilton. So guys, real quick, stand by for our sponsor. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. All right, guys, we're back. Okay, so this is going to be another topic. Again, it's part two. If you haven't, check out the first video. I'll put the link into the first video at the end of this. It is a great conversation. It's a needed topic. And again, it's the balance between work and home. How do we keep things balanced? So uh, real quick, we all know my first guest on the bottom. That's Russ Hamilton. Russ has been on our show multiple times before. Russ, how you doing, my man? You mind reintroducing yourself to my audience and also tell them about this Facebook page called Keeper of Chaos? Yeah, I'm I'm fantastic at doing here. Um, been uh, doing some new things, branching out a little bit. Um, I've got on my I have a Facebook page now called Keepers of Chaos. They should look that up. Um, this is going to be similar to a lot of uh, corrections sites out there, except I'm really going to be focusing on training in this, and so I'm looking to bring a lot of uh, good content to it and uh, trying to make this particular site a driver to drive to people that have good content like yourself, like uh, Gary York, like Keith Helwig, and eventually we'll have some other people uh, you know, that'll, that'll be on there with equally good content, and have a, it'll be a jumping off point for uh, corrections officers to find the best training that there is in the US. So it's a page to give advice and get advice. Give advice, get advice, or just hang out and see what's going on. And I notice you have to work in corrections to be on this page because they do ask a series of uh, questions. So I, I believe you either have to work in corrections or have worked in corrections. Or, or have worked in corrections, but I've made, it, I've made an exception. So if you are actively seeking employment, I mean, we're going to keep an eye on it really well. I've got some good moderators in there, and uh, they're, all, they're already, you know, uh, uh, you know, filtering people out. So anyone that's looking to also get into corrections, they can come there, but we'll be checking those people as, as closely as we can. Well, and, and trust me, uh, I'm sure you'll do great because you're also connected to the Correctional Officer Brotherhood. They have a great page. The admins are great. Moderation is very well done. So again, we're oh. trying to keep things professional. Yeah, I, I, I love those guys. You know, that's really, that's, well, that's where I met you. That's, and so, you know, I that, that can't, say, can't say enough good about that between the, uh, you know, Keith Helwig and Eric Brainerd and all those guys running that one. Yeah, and I, I, I obviously our prayers go out to Donald. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, that's uh, it's sad. All right, guys. So uh, real quick, we also have our other guest here, William Young. William Young was connected to me by Katarina Spinaris, <laughs> who has the Desert Water Correctional Outreach out in Colorado. Again, very devoted to correctional health, uh, mental health and well-being. And William Young, again, wrote that book. It's going, to be, it's going to come out around March or April, and it's called When Home Becomes a Housing Unit. William, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience on the job, and then why you wanted to write this book? 
Yeah, uh, first I want to say thanks for having me on and, and allowing me to talk about the, the book and this this topic. It's uh, This is a discussion that, that is really needed in, in corrections, and, and Russ, I appreciate you being here too. Um, I wanted to write this book because we, uh, we, I think we underestimate our opponent, our opponent being the correctional environment and how it kind of penetrates our, our home life and how we interact with, with normal people. And so I wanted to share some experiences and some um, stories to, to kind of help other people see that they're not the only ones going through this. Now, um, I've been a corrections officer at my facility for 15 years, and before that, I worked uh, in the funeral business. And so I've seen over the last 20 years a lot of trauma, and I know how it can affect you if you don't uh, appropriately process it uh, as you go along. Let me ask you a question. You know, uh, we've talked a few times before, and I don't think I've ever asked you this. Um, was this book sort of a healing process for you? Absolutely. I, I started this uh, kind of this journey for selfish reasons. I was in one of my little uh, bouts of uh, depression, I guess, that correctional officers have uh, every once in a while. And, and I sought out uh, some help and, and discovered Katerina. And so I, I started writing about it. And, and yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I write my issues down and then it forces me to figure out a way to, to handle them and to navigate them. So yeah, I, it, it helps me tremendously. Uh, to work through that. And, and so I hope it will help other people, you know, by sharing that a little bit. Well, I could speak firsthand. I got a chance to read the manuscript. Uh, Russ, maybe I'll send it your way with William's permission. I, I should have did that already. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Katerina sent it. I immediately endorsed it. Uh, the book hits home. I mean, it really is uh, experience. I think everybody that can relate to that manuscript, they'll pull something from it. And if everything, what I, if, if anything, what I hope it does, I hope it, it gives people courage to come out because that ultimately is the key. Just to remind people that, Hey, your story is not, you're not alone in your story. A lot of people share your story. And maybe I think that's another reason why you wrote the book an effort to get people to admit that, Hey, I'm hurting, I'm vulnerable and I need to tell someone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when we start the Academy and we go through, we have self-defense instructors that, that say, you know, Hey, you work in an environment where you may be kicked or punched or gassed or stabbed. And, and nobody ever questions that. Nobody ever says, well, why are you telling me these things? I mean, it's a small probability, right? But nobody ever tells us about the, 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 the emotional dangers, the psychological damage that can happen to you. And, and so uh, that's why I'm so glad that Katarina has and does what she does because it's kind of like an x-ray uh, for your emotional well-being. You know, if you, if you broke your arm, you'd go to the doctor and you'd figure out where it was broken, how to get it healed. But when we let these things pile up, we, we don't. We just internalize it and, and we think that we'll be okay. But, you know, but we don't if we don't deal with it. And Russ, that deals with how we process or don't process what we deal through on a regular basis, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I think that... Um, I think that the average person, if they if they stood in our shoes, would to a degree be, uh, you know, mortified by how much we go through that we sometimes don't even think about. And I don't think that we necessarily always assess, you know, what happens to us. You know, I, there are days where that would happen where, you know, I might get in, you know, a scuffle one minute and then be responding to uh, an inmate that had a, you know, a brick thrown up against the side of his head a little bit later in the day, and then uh, later on uh, be dealing with an inmate with uh, chest pains and having to make sure that I had a transportation team to take him out to the hospital. I mean, how many people do you honestly know that don't work into corrections that, um, that would deal with something like that in one, not in one day, but in five days a week? And to, I think it, it would be disingenuous for us to say that it doesn't take some, some toll because in, in one way or another, it, it's stressful, even if it's not necessarily violence directed at us, it's, it's still stress and it's uh, cumulative and it can ultimately be destructive. And I know as for me, I, I never want to, I never want to admit that, you know, I'm, I'm made of iron and everything bounces off of me, mm. but, uh, you know, I, I think I think that it's uh, that now we've come to a point where we need to say, hey, you know what? We need to take into account that we're not iron, we're not steel, and uh, we need to be assessing these things. Because I'll tell you, I, I know off the top of my head, uh, I know eight people that have committed suicide, 
in corrections. You know, and what's scary is what makes us a little different uh, than police. And again, not to minimize and negate because obviously they're heroes too and they have their own concerns, but we're focused more on the correctional side of things is the, the, we can't escape our environment. I mean, you know, we have to go right back into the same confines and deal with the same individuals. It's just, it, it, I feel like we get put into that hopeless environment again. And unfortunately, it doesn't give us a chance to look forward to anything. So here we are trying to break away from something, but only knowing that eventually we have to go back. And I, I mean, William, from your perspective, how is that? I mean, just having to go back to that same environment and not being able to escape it at you know, just, just kind of going through the same thing day in, day out and just, you know, yeah, I'll deal with it today. And just when you think you're doing good, you got to go right back in it tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, I, I equate it to, to that scene in, in every action movie where, where our heroes, you know, bent over some dirty clawfoot tub in this back room, right. And the guy's got him by his hair and he's going to drown him and he puts his head under the water for a little bit. And then he pulls him up just long enough to take a, take a breath of air before he right. goes right back under. And I, and, and I feel like that's how I spend my work week, right? I come up and I have just enough time to catch a little bit of breath of air. And during that time, I have to be a dad and I have to help with homework and I have to coach basketball. And, and, and all the while, I know that in a few hours, I have to go right back to that same environment. And that's why our stress levels and obesity levels and, and our suicide rate is higher than, you know, uh, police and, 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 you know, it's on par with veterans too. Because we don't get to escape that environment. We're, we're not immersed in it and then removed and, and have the time to process. We're, we're right back in it, you know, every single day. Now, now, William, break down your book for us a little bit. So how did you organize it and why did you organize it in the way that you did? Um, uh, me and Katarina kind of collaborated on that and, and, uh, I, I've written several articles for her and for desert waters and we kind of an overall theme was, um, you know, how the negativity, uh, sneaks into your, into your personal life. And so, uh, we, we picked the stories and the articles that, that we felt kind of encompassed that theme. Um, you know, there, the, the first one, I, uh, that I talk about feeling it is, is um, I think a good start because we all kind of know that feeling when we're sitting on our couch, you know, the day before we got to go back or the morning we wake up and we got to go in and our stomach starts to tighten and we're just, we're just upset because we have to go back to, you know, to our facility for a week and we know what's waiting there, you know? Um, and so uh, the story just kind of progressed from there. Um, and I, you know, Katarina laid it out in the way that she thought, and I just really like kind of how it progresses in my mind when I wrote them, it gets a little bit darker and darker and darker as it goes on. Um, but yeah, other than that, there's really no, you know, no particular order. We just wanted, I just wanted to write a book and put it, put something out there. So, so people can, can read it and say, you know, that sounds like what happened last night in my living room, or that sounds like the argument I had with my wife or husband last night, you know, so they can kind of put themselves in, in, in their own shoes. And then their spouses can read it and say, man, this guy, uh, William Young, he's pretty screwed up. And then, and then they can say, well, no, I, I think he's right on, you know, it makes sense to me. Well, so. did you try to balance your book where people that are in the field can get a lot from it, but also people that know somebody in the field could also learn, maybe understand what their loved one is going through? Yeah, I mean, my target audience is is you guys, and 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 because I, I think that there's a lot of resources out there for, um, uh, you know, other people for for police and sheriffs and stuff, and so I wanted I wanted to when I write, I'm talking to you, right? I'm talking to Russ. I'm not talking to my buddy who's a mechanic or the guy down the street that's a banker. Uh, but I've I've had some some wives of correctional officers uh, look at it and read it, and I've gotten some feedback from some people that know me. And they say that uh, it gives them a good insight onto why I behave the way I do, why their husband spends two hours at the gym, you know. Uh, so normal people have read it. And some of the things are applicable, but my target audience is, is you guys, you know. Yeah, and I'll tell you right now, uh, from what, definitely again from what I read, um, it really does draw from how I feel. I mean, just the fact that you just mentioned right now your stomach turning – before you go to work, especially after you take like a week or two vacation. Hey, Russ, yeah. I mean, Russ doesn't get that no more. Russ is retired now, but Russ, do you remember that feeling in your stomach having to go back to work? Uh, you know, there, you know, my, my career like spans this gamut where there were 
you know, good times and not so good times. And there were times where, yeah, I was chewed up inside about going to work. And then there were other times where I was chewed up inside and chomping at the bit and couldn't wait to get there uh, just to, just for a release of the, of, of the stress. Cause I, cause I would be knowing, you know, I've got this set up and this lined up and I'm going to make a bust on this guy today and something's going to happen. And I mean, and it was in retrospect, it might've been bad. Cause I would be, I mean, I would be so jacked up about going into work and, and just, you know, so chomping at the bit and maybe that was good. Maybe that, maybe that was bad. Maybe I just talked myself into believing that, uh, that having that kind of an, an attitude was, was necessary. I, I don't really know. I loved my job, but I know at the same time that it, it did take a little bit out of me. And remember, guys, when we talk about stress, we're not always talking about the inmate population. Stress can come from different angles, from your immediate supervisors, admin. Um, it, it could come from anywhere. So don't just think that we're just focusing on the inmate population, but the concern is, is how we deal with that stress, whether we process it correctly or we don't process it. And the funny thing is when me and Russ were having the conversation a couple of days ago, I remember a line, one of my favorite plays ever written is Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. I think he wrote from a perspective that I could really relate to. And that's all his plays. I love all his plays, but obviously Death of a Salesman hit home to me because I related to that individual, even in high school. I related to Willie Loman. I just related to that character. And there's something he says, and I want to ask you, how, do, how does this apply to corrections? Because I know what he says right here applies to corrections. Even though he was a salesman, he says a line where you can't eat the orange and throw away the peel. And to me, it's a very powerful line because, again, I feel that we live that right now, that we give the best. And eventually we just don't have it anymore, but we keep trying because that's what correction demands every day. You, you cannot not give the best, even when you're drained. So I'll go to you first, William. What does that mean to you in corrections? You, you, you can't eat the orange and throw away the peel. One thing that has a lot to do with Russ just talked about, about being jacked at work. I mean, I think the, I think the, the good part of it is we're really good at what we do inside, right? I mean, the way we handle those emergencies and the way we react and make split second decisions and, and we're running around and high fiving each other and everything's good. I think we're really good at that. But I think the peel part is, is when we go home and we're emotionally drained, we're just, we're wiped out because we've been performing for eight or 12 or 16 hours. And then we're just, we're just done. Um, you know, and we don't, we don't have, we don't have anything left. And I think, you know, when Russ talked about this a second ago, uh, you know, maybe it not being so good, I think that in some aspects, and it's going to sound kind of crazy, but being inside is, is sometimes easier than dealing with the stressors outside, right? Because we become really good at what we do in there and, and we know how to handle it exactly. And, and, you know, people react to us when we, when we say things, but then outside, you know, it's a completely different story, right? Your kids don't take out the trash when you want to, uh, you know, people are honking and flipping you off outside, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it that's the peel part of it, I think. If that well, makes Russ, sense. Wait. No, no, that makes perfect sense. Actually, I want to add on to Russ's part of the question, because he mentioned something that just hit home with me with the, I never, no one's ever mentioned that before, but you just mentioned, that's why it's good to have these shows, because even if you cover the same topic, there's always a different perspective. And what you just said, you talked about the stressors, on the outside possibly being harder than the stressors on the inside. And Russ, I got to ask you, man, does that mean we're so automatic that we don't even realize we're going through these stressful moments on the inside? I think that what happens is, is, um, is the experience that you have behind the walls. Um, eventually at some point, everything that's happening back there, there becomes a normalcy about it. And so, um, and so um, when you're operating at what that baseline normalcy is, for most people, it's way down here, you know. The things that happen beside the wall, our normalcy is way up here. And we're functioning at these higher levels and we're doing all kinds of stuff. And he's right. I mean, we're, we're exceptional at it. We're, we're going in there. We're stopping fights. We're using, we're using pepper spray. Violent things are happening. Medical emergencies are happening. And... And the fact of the matter is, is that is that, that what's normal for us isn't normal for most people. Yeah, and I, I, I got to uh, give props where props do. You know, I, I've done over 
400 something on videos on YouTube. I've done uh, countless podcasts, you know, over the course of four or five years. I don't think I've ever had anybody tell me that before, but it makes total sense about the stressors on the outside uh, being a little bit more difficult than the stressors on the inside. Because usually we're focusing our conversation on the inside out. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're talking about the stress from the job and then having that apply to homes. The same as your book, right? When home becomes a housing unit. But what what's the perspective? I mean, are we looking at home affecting the facility or are we looking at the facility affecting home, William? Or both? Uh, well, I think both. I think, and, and you guys touched on it, that, you know, that old adage, uh, leave work at work and home at home. Right. And I, I, I think it's impossible. I think, I think what you know, Russ is saying is I think that we're institutionalized. I think after a certain amount of years, we get comfortable in those cinder block walls, man, with the gray and the beige. I mean, that's, it, it's easier for us to handle a chaotic block or a chaotic yard than it is to handle, you know, dinner at your sister-in-law's on a Saturday night. I mean, and it's because our switch gets worn out and because, and, and as, as crazy as it sounds, jail's easy, prison's easy, right? I mean, even with the inmate population, you know, they, why do they keep coming back? Because the responsibilities are different and they're, they're simplified. And so I think that because we are so jacked up and we're, we're doing so well in there and we're operating at that, that high level, like he's talking about, that it's almost, uh, we're almost uh, disappointed or, uh, you know, like clinically depressed when we don't have that adrenaline dump, you know? Well, would you believe, Russ, that part of that balance is also being surrounded by people that are sharing the same experiences as you? Well, yeah, you know, there, the, the, shared, the shared experience aspect is one of those things that, that you can't discount because when, when you're going in there and your safety is dependent upon the guy that's next to you and the guy on your other side, his safety is dependent on you, um, it makes for, you know, some, some pretty intense friendships, even if those friendships are only, are only at work. And if, if you're not – if you're not getting, and obviously you're not, if you're not getting that experience outside the workplace, it makes it all that much easier to come into the workplace and hide and forget about those problems that are, that are, you know, lurking there at home, no matter how simple they may be, they seem really complex uh, compared to what you go through with just being next to your buddies who are willing to, you know, fight and die for you. So it's kind of weird because I'm getting like, a, and this is great, guys. I'm getting like an abnormal normalcy, if you will. Like we get I, a. I would I would be comfortable with that description. Right. Yeah. Because because we we go to the job and we get um, used to that, obviously, which is obviously getting used to a world that is uh, highly unusual, highly aggressive. I mean, you know the. The list goes on, but we get used to that. We get accustomed to that. But is that beneficial for us, though? Or are we saying that there has to be a certain level? We also realize that we can't get too comfortable with it. What's your thoughts on that, Will? I mean, is there a balance there? I mean, do we want to get comfortable where we're able to process it well? Or do we want to be careful of how comfortable we get? I mean, I'll, I'll give you guys a little story real quick. Um, my nephew took his life in 2006. And for a second... I was cold to that loss because I had seen so many inmates do it before. So it didn't affect me how I felt it should have affected me. And that's when I started reevaluating myself. I'm very self-aware. Uh, that's one of the benefits and, uh, that I think I have coming into this field. And that's one of the things I always tell people going to the field, know yourself. So when I realized that I was having a problem having any emotion over something that should have that emotion, I knew that something was wrong with me, that I've got accustomed to something that I shouldn't have gotten accustomed to. Then when I was hanging out with my guys, the officers at the job, and let's say an inmate took their own life, some of them would crack jokes, but I don't think they meant to crack jokes to insult. I just think that's what they did to handle what they just saw. They added a sense of sarcasm or whatever it was so they can process it because these were not people that didn't have hearts. I worked with them. They did have hearts. I saw how they worked on the job. I know they had heart. But then you're sitting there and, and, and sometimes you're, you know, just got off this inmate suicide and you're all talking about it. And then you get this person that you know that's not him and they're cracking jokes. And you're sitting there like, wow, this is totally 
different than how I think you are, but then that person, maybe that's just how they adjust to it. So is, is there a line here between that um, adjustment of what we said, the abnormal normalcy? Yeah, I think that I think that we don't process it, and and there's all different ways that trauma affects people. And so I've been in a similar situation where I've been standing in an office full of officers, and we just we just cut a guy down, right? And people are making just obscene comments. I mean, and it's 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 because they're they're not dealing with it. I mean, at that moment, and like you said, these are really good guys, these are really good gals, but they're not they're not dealing with it. They're they're separating. Uh, they're making this person that just died not a person, right? Because that's how they can deal with it. And that's what I did when I picked up bodies when I worked in the funeral home. I, I would I would find a way to make this person not, you know, not related to like my kids or anybody else. It was just the job that I was doing. But I can tell you after not picking up a body for 15 years, it that stuff catches up with you. And so uh, that's what I try to tell them. And, you know, when they say, well, I, you know, I can't believe you let this, this bother you. And I'm like, yeah, because I've, cut down hundreds of people and I don't want to see dead people anymore. And, and I, and I know that when you're home alone, after all these people go away, that, that this ghost is going to come back and get you if you, if you don't deal with it. And I deal with a lot of stuff with humor and sarcasm too. Um, but I know that at some point I'm going to have to sit and I'm going to have to, I mean, there's been days that I've drove home from work that I cry my, that I cry on the way home because of, and sometimes it's not even anything happened. It's just uh, it's just the, the the walls and the slamming of the doors and the locks engaging and and the yelling and 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 the threat of something happening at any moment and then it doesn't happen. And it's just it's too much sometimes. And so yeah, I mean absolutely you're right. They they're not they're not processing it and they're they could be doing it because they think that that's what other people want to hear. Right. They could be doing it because they just don't know how to react to it. And, and that's one of the things that I, one of the chapters in my book is called, I picked up another ghost today. And it's about this very thing. It's about all the things that we see that come back and haunt us later because we, we don't, we don't deal with it. We don't know how to deal with it. Well, you know what, Russ, again, going back to <laughs> about with comparing the, the stressors of the real world versus the stressors of the prison or the jail environment have you ever had anything in your 30 year career uh, on, you know, on the outside, not behind the wall that you felt should have affected you in a certain way, but maybe you sort of thought you were immune to it because of what you've been, what's been going on behind the wall, what you've experienced, you know, in the prisons you've worked at? Oh, you know, I, I think many times I, I know, and I, I, I can only, I can only talk about a certain aspect of this. Because of because of um, it's it still affects me to this day, but um, I was I was at a dinner party with some people, and they were telling they were telling some little stories and stuff, and then they asked me about where I worked, which was death row, and I mentioned a story to them about this serial killer and what he had done and what he had in his cell and stuff, and I realized all of a sudden that this was a completely inappropriate thing that I was telling them. These yeah. people were mortified. They had no idea that this world existed uh, whatsoever. And I think uh, going, going back to what we were talking about a moment ago, I think that part of the reason that we crack those jokes and whatever you want to call it, gallows humor or whatever, is that, is that um, regardless of whatever that inmate's done, he is a human being, and the one thing that all human beings will experience is death. And so um, from the mortality aspect, if you can depersonalize that and make that inmate or whoever it is not human anymore, that's a way to not have to face your own mortality. And, and that's, that's, why I, that's why I think we do that. And it's sad because that means you're, redu you're reducing the – humanity into like objects hmm, I don't you know, know that. Oh, hold on alexa just responded to something here alexa off <laughs> <laughs> right by my alexa there's something that you thought was alexa uh -oh. comes out and she goes humanity i don't know that you know what I, mean? I was like all right whatever <laughs> but basically you you it's true you know you're I, I like what both you guys said is you're reducing that human connection to an object and that separate you from it you know no different than killing a bug unfortunately you know and we don't want to live our lives that way that's why for me one of the things i always did was 
always, I, I have an appreciation for life just in general. I don't want to lose any sense of that because as I said, when my nephew passed, I, I didn't know how to, uh, you said the switch. I didn't know what is it, turn off, turn on. I, I, I didn't know how to put the switch where it needed to be. And unfortunately, a death that w would, should warrant some serious emotion was tough for me to draw out. I actually felt like I was faking the emotion. I, 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 I just did. Everybody around me is crying and I'm thinking I should be crying. I should be upset. But why don't I feel it? And instead, what I was feeling was these animosity. Like, you're, why, you're a fool. Why'd you do this? You know what I mean? You know, it wasn't because I was angry at him. It was because I, I deal with it every day at the prison. You know, you, you see these inmates, you know, killing themselves or making these attempts to kill themselves, and you start to become immune to the attempt. It's like, oh, here he goes again, trying to kill himself. And, you know, not realizing that that is abnormal behavior. And we're responding to it as if it's just another day at the job. So I really think this was something that we didn't discuss last time, Russ. We, we discussed a very good balance uh, between work and home, but we really didn't discuss, and I think this is great that we had this today because it kind of complements what we did. We, it re we really didn't discuss the abnormal environment that we have to try to normalize, you know? And, and, and you know, the different ways that people try to normalize that abnormality. Hey, 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 young, you know, you wrote a book, you know, you're, you know, you've dealt through this. What were some of the different ways that you try to process some of the abnormal stuff in your environment? I, and I would like your answer on that too, Russ, when uh, William's done. I think this is a good question. So maybe people can recognize certain signs from your experience to say maybe that they're not doing it right. We talked about sarcasm, you know, sarcasm when it may be inappropriate. Like, I, I don't think it's ever really appropriate to laugh and joke about a death no matter whose it is unfortunately again not saying i'm an inmate lover but our jobs are job an inmate death that means that there could be a chance that we failed that we were supposed to i mean there's many levels of of response that we should have but one of them i don't think is to laugh about it because we also are ultimately responsible for that individual and our job is dependent on that individual's well-being uh safety and security obviously so what are some other abnormal responses that we may have that we don't realize we're having like again like the sarcasm well i'll tell you um i'm i'm uh, burnt out because i saw uh so many deaths obviously when i worked in the funeral home i picked up so many bodies i picked up homicides suicides hangings pulled people out of a river i've seen everything that you could possibly see and so and then in 2006 it's funny you say that my my mom passed away from cancer and that was like a nuclear bomb man so everything after that I've been pretty numb to. Um, and so the way I react to it or process is, is I, is I just don't, I mean, I, I have this thing that I say that I, there's two kinds of people that I, that are in this world. Those that I would go to their funeral if they died in a car crash and those that I wouldn't. And, and, and so, I mean, and that's the truth and that's not right. And that's not appropriate because I, I am trying to work through and, but my switch is, is worn out. And so when I hear about a death or I hear about something, my reaction is like if we have an inmate that passes away or we have, you know, uh, an officer that, that, you know, dies by suicide, we, I'm the one that's like, okay, well let me handle it because I'm, I, I'm emotionally numb to that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't want to subject somebody else to it. I'll just go do it. But then that adds, you know, more to me. Um, you but you talked about that explosion. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, and so that's just one of the things that I do. And I, I, I guess I say if it doesn't affect my inner circle, then I just, I just don't give it any of my time, you know? And that's not, like I said, that's not an appropriate response, but emotionally that's where I'm at. And that's why I'm, you know, writing these kind of things to, to let people know that, Hey, if you don't deal with it and you don't process it, then man, you could get to a point where you have a, a loved one die a close one, like, a grandfather, a grandmother, you know, uh, other friends and relatives. And you're just, you're like, Oh, that's bad. You know, but you, but that's it. You're like, meh. Okay. And you know? I like what you're saying. You're talking about that pressure and you just don't know how much you're able to put on top before it explodes. And, and Russ, you know, what about for you? What, what would be uh, your opinion on that? Oh, you know, there's, there's just such a, a range of things that, that I think all of us have, have experienced in uh, corrections of, of, one, of one sort or another. Um, 
you know, I got to a point where, you know, I told you about that story that I was telling that I thought, I thought it was an interesting story and it turned out it was completely inappropriate. I just worked to try and sensitize myself uh, to, to thinking about, you know, how I should be reacting to stories like that. I should still have an abundance of horror in my heart and, uh, you know, try and think about things from a more human perspective. I had a, um, I had an incident uh, early on in early on in my career where um, and where an inmate uh, got uh, shot in the head, and I ended up you know carrying him to medical, and we came back and the lieutenant was there and you know he started doing all the things that he was supposed to do. The lieutenant was about you know uh, getting help for anyone that needed it or whatever, and he says, "Does anyone have any comments?" And I said, yeah, they're serving spaghetti in the snack bar. And, and this was right after, the, you know, there was just gray matter all, all over the ground. And to me, I guess that was my way of dealing with it, you know. And, uh, but, that was, but that was a big deal. I, it wasn't that, you know, I didn't freak out over it or anything like that. But I definitely, you know, reached out and hit that switch. And I didn't let, you know, any of that negativity in. Or at least I didn't think I did. So. You know, I, I think there's just a range of ways that we try and deal with things. Some are good. Maybe some are helpful. Maybe some aren't so helpful. Yeah, and that's something that I think is really going to hit home because we didn't discuss that last time we had our discussion, Russ. We, we talked a lot about the balance between work and home, but we never talked about how we deal with, I guess, the abnormal normalcy. I kind of like using that. Uh, I think maybe if you write another book next time, you can kind of use that phrase because it is the truth. It's normalizing the abnormal. You know, as you read your manuscript, you also mentioned something called unconventional suicide. Now, I've never heard of that term before. Uh, Russ, have you ever heard of that before? Uh, not until now. So what, what does that mean, uh, William? So I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we don't talk a lot about is, is suicide and corrections, but it's a huge problem. It's a huge deal. And so I have this story in the book uh, called Six Reasons, and it's about a guy who goes home every night and eats dinner with his wife and his kid. And then he goes out to his garage and he puts six shells in his, uh, six bullets in his revolver and, uh, and then pours a glass of whiskey and tries to think of six reasons to not, to not kill himself. And, um, yes. you know, and so I, I talk about how, how absurd I thought that was and how could a guy seemingly have everything, you know, be on the verge of suicide. And then I, I kind of reflected on my own life choices and I started looking at, at people around me uh, other officers and and you know I would I would go home after the swing shift and I'd and I'd stop at uh, you know some fast food restaurant grab a bunch of food and I'd go home and I'd I'd stay up late and I and I wasn't working out and I wasn't taking care of myself and then I and and then I just thought you know I'm I'm doing the same thing that this guy's doing only I'm using bull burritos instead of bullets you know and, and and so you look around and we work long hours and and it's a high stress job and and we're all on uh, you know, some sort of blood pressure medication or, or, you know, diabetes. If you look at the, the stats of correction officers and our, our medical issues, it's, it's, it's out of control. And so I think that when I say unconventional suicide, I think that when we don't do anything to combat those things, when, you know, we know we have those types of issues and, and, and you know, we don't, we don't care, we, we're not going to take care of ourselves. It's just kind of like putting that bullet in the revolver and seeing what happens. I mean, it's, it's no different than driving your vehicle and just closing your eyes and, and seeing what happens. And so I think that uh, when we talk corrections fatigue and, and how this place kind of affects us, I think that we assume that if we're not at home, you know, in the dark, you know, crying over a, a Subaru car commercial, uh, you know, with a loaded gun that, that we're fine. Right. But uh, that's not the case. I mean, this thing takes on all shapes and, and, and sizes and with the, the stress that our body's under and the poor life choices that we're making. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing nothing to, to, to help ourselves. And, and so in my mind, we're, we're killing ourselves just in a different way. Wow. That's a, that's a very unique term. I love it. And I think that's something now that uh, maybe it'll gain some traction because I've never heard the term before, but it makes a lot of sense. And for guys that, just seen that the screen switch between Russ and uh, Will, that's because we had to switch conferences, switch rooms. 
So unfortunately, when we came back in, uh, Russ came in first this time and Will, where last time it was Will and then, and then Russ. Um, hey, Russ, unconventional suicide. I know in your case here, you're always working out. You're always running. I mean, I, you got the, 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 the little, what's it called? The go cam? Oh, yeah. You know, um, well, I'll tell you what. It, it's not always been that way through, through my career. I mean, I've been alternately in shape and out of shape. And a lot of that's, you know, due to um, either mandatory overtime or overtime where I'm just a slave to the man and, and, and working it out. And it's, it's really unhealthy. And um, if, you're, if you're in a position where you're depressed or what have you, yeah, it, it can be a form of very slow, unconventional suicide. You know, now that I've, now that I've retired and stuff, I'm much more... I'm much more the way that I normally would be. I'm much more myself. And, you know, I run, I run two or three 10 Ks every week and I try and, you know, I'm, I try and lift in the gym, every, you know, at least twice or three times a week. And I love being able to do that and being able to afford the time. If you're working 60, 70, 80 hours in a week, you can't do that. And so that's, I, I think that, um, I think the amount of mandatory overtime that we have is is really a shame. I think it, I think it really uh, destroys some people whether they realize it or not. Man, and I would like to think obviously working out is also a great way to reduce stress. I mean, would you agree, Bill? Or, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I there was a time when I was on the on the day shift, and I, you know, me and my wife would go to the gym afterwards, and I'd I'd be able to get rid of all that frustration and 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 all that anxiety and, and everything. And I felt great, right? You feel you're in shape and your endorphins start going, but you know, Russ is right. Now I'm in a predicament where as most of us are, if you look at the trends and corrections, we're all working 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And when you come home off a 16 hour shift and you have less than eight hours before you have to go back for another one, you're not thinking about doing push ups. I mean, you can't even get off the couch. Right. And so, uh, you know, you really let yourself go downhill and then, I think that some of us get in a situation where we just, we just don't care because no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to get out of the situation. And so, you know, we just uh, not say that we give up, but uh, we, we sort of do. You just, you know, throw caution to the wind and see what happens. Right. Yeah. Which, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Finish your thought. Go ahead. Finish your I was thought. Say, which is crazy because we are supervising guys that are doing, thousands of push-ups a day and they're in super shape and they're they're taking care of themselves you know there's a there's a a book that i read uh, my buddy read it to me and it's it, it it talks about two individuals and the one you know gets up in the morning and he eats a great breakfast and he works out and he goes to work and he he's able to connect with family and friends and and he's just he's just living a really fulfilling life and then the the second paragraph talks about this guy who you know, gets up late and he's super stressed out and he's up to debt in his eyeballs and he just, you know, he just is miserable, right? And he, he talks about all these things that he wants to do with his life and he just doesn't do any of it. And then it goes on to tell you that the first guy is an inmate at the prison the second guy works at. Mm. It, it, you know, and I, it was like a punch in the gut because that, that's me if I'm not careful. That's all of us, you know, um, it, it, because of all of the things that we deal with and the pressure and the stress and, and, you know, the balance and our lives are out of whack. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, we do, it's crazy that we, a lot of us don't do anything, but go home and sit on the couch and wait to go back to our facilities. I mean, we're, we're not even, you know, we have, we supervise people that would love to have what we have and we don't, we don't take advantage of it. It's crazy. Okay. That's extremely powerful what you just said. Like we don't realize how lucky we have it. And uh, unfortunately, here we are. And we say it sometimes. Sometimes if an inmate gets on, you know, on our nerve, we may say, yeah, well, at least we get to go home uh, after our eight or 16 hours. But we probably don't realize how, how good that should be, how good that should feel. We shouldn't get used to just saying that just to say that. We should actually feel that, internalize that. You know, Basic, the gist of it all right now, before we get into one more thing, because right now we focused on how we need to help ourselves, how we need to notice things in ourselves and how we need to better ourselves and kind of putting a lot of the responsibility on us as well as it should be, not arguing that, of course. 
But there's another perspective I still want to provide, and that's when there could be individuals that are so lost or may not know that they're going through something, and that's where that support comes in. And again, that's something that your manuscript touches as well. It talks about the importance of that support um, that, that helps you go through the moments that you don't need to go through alone. So uh, we'll start with Bill, and then uh, uh, Russ, if you don't mind, I'd like you to kind of respond to this as well. But what is it that our peers can look for? What are the signs? I mean, how do they know that we need help? Well, I mean, that's, and, and, and so here's the problem, right? We are, we're all burnt out. We're all tired. We're all just trying to get home, right? We're all missing things our kids are doing. I mean, and so it's, it's really hard to care when we're just fighting for air, right? And so we, we, we miss those little things. And so we need to participate in our coworkers' lives and and notice them. I mean, if I come to work on a day and I'm not singing in the halls or I'm not cracking jokes, I mean, people pull me aside and say, hey man, what's going on with you today? And I just say, you know what, I, I, I don't have it today. I mean, I'm barely treading water today, but thanks for asking. You know, I'll be fine tomorrow, but today I'm not good. And I think that you, you have to monitor that kind of stuff, but to do that, you have to kind of force yourself to care, right? I mean, you have to say, you know, I have to, I have to be invested in, in, in my coworker. And, you know, if we, if we're making crazy comments or we're, you know, we self isolate at work for our own protection. Right. But we, you know, we don't want the inmates to know, you know, what's going on with our lives where we live and stuff. And then we isolate at home too. And we isolate our, our coworkers when we're making those comments that we talked about earlier with, you know, the trauma we see and stuff, they feel like they can't reach out. They can't talk to people about the things that are bothering them. And then that, that puts them in a, in a really bad, in a bad position. Uh, but I think that we have to know, we have to spend time. We have to force ourselves to care and, 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 and say, Hey man, what's, what's going on with you? I mean, I've had, I've had coworkers pull me aside and say, Hey, um, you know, if it wasn't for you, I don't know if I'd come to work today or if it wasn't for my daughter, I would have hung myself in my garage last night. I mean, those kind of statements, uh, those are, those are real things that, that we're going through on a daily basis. And so you have to check in with them and somebody, somebody has got, listen, a correctional facility is a dark and soulless pit of existence, right? And somebody has got to be the lighthouse. Somebody has to be the guy that says, are you okay? And you know, some days that's me. And thankfully some days uh, it's somebody else for, for me. You know, but if enough of us are doing it, it'll create a culture of, of being able to open up and talk about the things that bother us. And, 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 and so if everybody's comfortable saying, Hey, I'm not okay. Uh, then, then, you know, it'll help some of us, I think. Well, I will say before we get into Russ's answers, you draw on some very tremendous metaphors that I think will help connect those from the outside because, you know, I, the, the lighthouse, the dark, I, I, I love it. And I want to mention something before Russ answers. Um, I agree with the strength of family behind that wall, actually, because I just went through something. And again, I can't be, get too personal with it because, you know, obviously I'm still connected to the job, but the people that just come and, you're, and, and show support. And then I went out with a bunch of good people uh, the other day, and it was just like an appreciation for each other. It was an apartment that, you know, we steer away from as officers because we don't under, really understand their purpose. And, and I, I wish we would. I mean, it's an apartment that's meant to clean out and make sure it's more safe and secure for us. But sometimes we look at this department as they're the enemy, but they're not. They actually do have a, fit, a purpose. And we just don't understand it for some reason. But as you start to move up, you definitely understand it. And um, it's just amazing how we all came together as a family and showed support. And I agree with you 100%. I mean, not only is it needed, but it's there. It's there if you look for it. it. Just may not. It may not be where you automatically. Sometimes it may not be where you automatically think it's going to be. Sometimes it's going to be in in the hands of somebody else who you may not expect it to be from. But again, it's there. And 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 for those that don't take the time to look, the funny thing is, and like you mentioned, people will find you anyway. Like you said, you didn't know you had a concern, but someone stepped up and brought it out, and that's what I don't think you're going to get anywhere else outside of corrections. I'm sorry. It's the closeness of the environment. We're not spaced out. Some cases we, we, you know, we see each other 
all the time again because you're working behind that wall so one of our brothers may miss something but another brother or sister is going to come up and i don't i would never trade that for the world i, I really wouldn't and trust me the options were there and that's the one thing that no matter what this profession was going through whatever it was going through i stayed because of that i just felt like leaving the job it would be abandoning people that just became family to me and i, I and i love this is the weird thing but i love the family i like the profession right yeah and what's your thoughts on that russ well yeah you know the, um if there's if there's anyone that can appreciate what we're going through on a day-to-day -day basis it's that brother or sister to the right or to the left of us you know and i think um as an individual if you're if you're a member of the line staff uh, take a minute, check people's temperature to the right and left of you when you can. You can't, like, like William was saying, you know, maybe you can't do that every day because you just don't have enough of it in you, but some days you can. And if you're a supervisor, um, perhaps even more importantly, encourage your people to do this. Um, remind them, hey, you know what? We're, we're all in this together. We're all having a tough week. There's a lot of mandatory going on the next few days and stuff. Pull someone aside, ask them how they're doing. Just you know, get a simple nod from them. And I think a supervisor encouraging um, people to do that is an even bigger reaction than just one or two taking it upon themselves because it reminds everyone of where they sit. And maybe if you're having a problem and uh, someone you know comes up and says, "Hey, what what is really happening with you right now? Some, something's wrong." you'll realize the reason they're doing it is because they've been encouraged and they want to bring that to the table. And, and Russ, you know, before we come to a close, because um, I think we covered a lot, and I think we can definitely have this discussion again, because again, we've covered this topic mo multiple times, but I don't think we've covered this perspective. And I'm sure there's going to be other perspectives as we progress through. We can always do this topic again, but you brought up something real quick. Um, you were a supervisor. You were an immediate frontline supervisor. You were a sergeant. Um, I'm sure some cases, when you see it, employee morale go down, whether it's in an individual or just the shift itself, what would be some advice that you would do to kind of lift that employee morale, just to kind of keep things healthy? Well, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can you can attack it from. I think I think number one though is if is if as a unit, if you're cohesive and if you're effective at, at running a safe shift so that you know that hey you know we got in there we took care of the things we needed to do people were functioning uh, maybe we took care of some uh, some problems with some officers that, that weren't functioning you know and got them you know back on track and stuff and then at the end of it you all you all end up you know going out together if you can of course obviously different people may get relieved and stuff but just that feeling of having achieved something in that shift in that unit that day where everyone went home safe maybe maybe the fact of the matter is maybe you maybe you pulled off a, a raid on a dorm or a cell block or uh, you were all instrumental in getting together and uh, stopping some contraband from uh, entering the facility but doing things together and it's those it's those activities that you do together that helps build bonds and it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be something you know huge or earth shaking. It just has to be something that you know has an a, has a good effect on the on the um, facility or or the unit. Do you know why I brought that up, guys? Real quick, does any anybody have an idea of why I brought that up? Because that's one of the on scene benefits of lineup, which seems to be taken away from everybody. You know, besides the obvious, to give it up the information. Obviously, the obvious one hundred ones. <laughs> is the on-scene benefit of lineup where we all have to see each other at that point and all right. kind of, you know make sure everybody's okay and a supervisor to make sure the employee morale is where it should be i'm a big fan of lineup and it's a shame that we lost that hey uh, i'll start with russ this time russ would you like to say anything in closing i just want to say um thank you william for uh bringing this uh book and especially i love the title and stuff and i'm, I'm really jazzed that uh <clears throat> excuse me I'm really jazzed that you know someone took the time to do a book like this and uh, put this stuff out there and stuff. Um, probably uh, some of this stuff is are things that you know I naturally wouldn't always want to talk about while I was doing this actively in my career. 
now I'm kind of learning a little bit. Uh, my hats are off to William. I want to make sure that you get that book. Okay. Um, so Russ, um, I'll forward it to you because William said I, I can, I can, uh, I can forward that off to you. Um, Excellent. All right, and then, and Will, what, any any closing thoughts? You got a book coming out in the market. It's going to be around March, late March, early April. Book hit home. It's literally is when home becomes a housing unit. What do you expect people to take from this book? And and just ultimately, if they decide, because we're going to do a show closer to the release of the book. This is just to let people know what's out there. But ultimately, what would you want people to take from this book? And and what do you want to achieve from this book? I guess what I want people to understand is that they're the things that they're going through are not uh, unique. I guess they're, they're the same things that I'm going through that Russ went through that, that, you know, 400,000 of us in the United States are going through. Uh, you, so you're not alone. You don't have to carry the weight of corrections by yourself. We'll be, the rest of us will be right there to help you uh, carry it as well. And if you feel like you need to talk to somebody, then go talk to somebody. Talk to a friend or a counselor or or whoever. Uh, the less the, the the more you talk about your nightmares, the less scary they become. And and so I guess that's that's what I want for my for my fellow brothers and sisters to, you know, I don't want them to get to the point where they feel like they have to sit down and write a book because they're they're damaged, right? I want them to to see this and say, man, I noticed some of these things. Now, how can we stop this? How can we restore, uh, you know, our life back to the way, the way it should be for us? Uh, because we do a hard job. We do a thankless job and it's, uh, you know, where you know, nobody has a correctional lives matter stickers on their car, right? It's, I mean, it's a thankless job. And so I want them to know that what they do is super noble. And, and, you know, I like when you say heroes, um, they just need to have that pride, man, and, and keep doing what they're doing and, and that I appreciate them. Well, hey, hey, Russ, I would got to say, Bill speaks like a writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he's doing good. And I, I'm like I say, I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, that, you know, someone I, I, I think more than one person, but someone out there is going to find some sort of solace in this book that's going to help them. And, and to me, that's that's truly heartwarming. Yeah. And, and don't forget, guys, after we post it. You know, try to put a comment up so you get notified when the comments, because the comments usually come sporadically. I mean, you know, we don't have that instant view, but we do get the viewership. I mean, I have videos in the 20, 30s, and thousands, but again, it's it's informative videos, so people kind of take from it when they need it. Um, but um, I just think there's a lot of good information here, and I can't wait to see how the audience responds to this. As always, guys, the show is here. Talk if you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. That bell is going to notify you every time I post a video. And as always, guys, from the three of us to our heroes out there, no matter what side of corrections you're on, whether you're civilian staff, custody, volunteer, this book is for you. And if you have loved ones that want to know what it is that you're going through, I think they should get a read of it as well. Because I, I think the book, the manuscript spells out a lot that we just don't know on both sides of the coin. As always, guys, stay safe.